Welcome to the second episode of The Cosmic Connection. I'm Eric Lerner, Chief Scientist at LPP Fusion. In the first episode, recorded in February 2020, I said we would be discussing the relationship between cosmology and society, and in particular, the importance of the conflict between the Big Bang idea of a universe that's running down and the scientific reality of a universe that's running up whose evolution is accelerating. Now, in early June 2020, the question of which way society here on Earth is going is very sharply posed. The coronavirus epidemic, the economic crisis, the racist murders, the global protests against them, mass layoffs, budget cuts, wage cuts, and austerity sweeping the world, are these the signs of a world slipping into chaos? first steps towards a new dark age? Or are they the symptoms of a form of society that has reached its limits? The symptoms of the need for a new way of running society that can lead to a new renaissance, an enormously better life for all of humanity. Right now, I want to begin to look in this series at what knowledge can be gained by looking at the universe and its evolution, how that can help us to understand what's going on now on Earth in social evolution. Now, we all know that the Big Bang hypothesis begins the history of the universe with a giant explosion at high temperature and high density. In the video series, The Real Crisis in Cosmology, that's the companion piece to this audio podcast series, we're showing that there are many big scientific reasons to believe that this supposed history is just a good story and not at all consistent with our observations of the cosmos. So if there was no Big Bang, how and where do we start the story of the universe? Well, there really is no beginning that we have any scientific evidence for. And therefore, no scientific reason for any uh, attempt to look for the real start of it all. As Hannes Alfein, winner of the 1970 Nobel Prize for Physics, wrote, to try to write a grand cosmical drama leads necessarily to myth. To try to let knowledge substitute ignorance in increasingly large regions of space and time is science. So instead of looking for the real start of it all, let's ask what is the earliest stage of universal evolution that we have any observational evidence for? Now we have a big clue to this question because when we look deep into space, we don't see galaxies moving at any arbitrary velocities. We don't see them moving with velocities much higher than 1,000 kilometers a second, and most are moving relative to each other a good deal slower. Now, this is pretty speedy by earthly standards, but it's only one three hundredth of the speed of light. Why is this a clue to finding very old objects? Well, if we know how fast things move, and we know how big an object is, we know the minimum amount of time that it took for that object to form. It's just the radius of the object divided by the maximum velocity. Now, it could have taken a great deal longer than that to form, but it couldn't have taken any shorter because things would not have enough time to move together to form the object. So if we want to look for evidence of the earliest stage of evolution, and thus look for the oldest objects, that might give us such evidence. We just have to look for the largest objects we can find. They will be the objects that are oldest. It turns out that the deeper we look with our telescopes into space, the larger the conglomerations of matter we find. Of course, there are galaxies, there are clusters of galaxies, superclusters of clusters, and even supercluster complexes built up out of superclusters. As of now, the largest objects we've discovered 
are vast concentrations of galaxies that are about 6 billion light years in radius. Since the galaxies that now make up these objects are moving about 1 300th the speed of light, simple arithmetic tells us that it must have taken at least 300 times 6 billion years, or 1.8 trillion years for these objects to form. That's over 100 times longer than the hypothesized age of the universe in the Big Bang Theory. Based on observations and physical processes we have verified here on Earth, what can these ancient objects tell us about the earliest observable stages of universal evolution? Well, we know from many observations that these vast objects are made up of plasma, electrically conducting gas, where the electrons are mostly stripped from their atoms and are free to move about. So we know they're subject to electromagnetic forces as well as to gravitational forces. Indeed, we have observations that show that there are tiny magnetic fields within these objects, which given the vast size of these objects must be generated by enormous electrical currents. Now, given just these observations, and we'll be detailing these observations in our accompanying video series, we can see how these objects could have come into existence and how they could have given rise to the whole hierarchy of superclusters, clusters, galaxies, and stars that we observe today. And we don't need to think in five dimensions or to use dark matter or dark energy. To do this, all we need to understand is three basic processes which have been studied for centuries. The first is the pinch effect, first discovered exactly 200 years ago by André Marie Ampere. This basic process pulls plasma together into long rotating filaments of vortices because electrical currents that are going in the same direction attract each other through the magnetic fields that they produce, while those going in opposite directions repel each other. What this means is that given enormous lengths of time, any tiny random currents moving through a plasma will gradually align with each other, little trickles of current merging slowly into vaster and vaster rivers of current, creating the huge primordial concentrations of matter, billions of light years across, that we now observe. The pinch effect concentrates matter along the axes of these titanic rivers of current. By the interaction of magnetic fields and electric currents, the filaments take the form of vortices, rotating immensely slowly in space. Now as these vortices of current and plasma grow, a second process emerged. That's gravitational contraction. That's first hypothesized as a formative process by Immanuel Kant 265 years ago. When vortices were small, their self-gravity was negligible. But as they grew, the ratio of gravitational to magnetic forces also grew. For vortices as large as 4 to 5 billion light years in radius, just the size we actually observe, gravity would be sufficiently strong to start to compress the plasma. Not much compression could occur perpendicular to the axis, as, if you remember your high school physics, angular momentum is conserved. So as matter contracted towards the axis, it would start to spin faster and would soon be spinning so fast that it would be impossible for further contraction to occur. But matter could contract along the axis, forming pancake-shaped rotating concentrations. At this point, a third process must have become important. That is the homopolar or disk generator effect. This effect was also first discovered a long time ago, back in 1835 by Michael Faraday. If a conducting material rotates in a magnetic field, 
that is in the direction of the axis of rotation. An electric field is created between the axis and the outside of the disk, and current flows towards the center of the disk, and then out along the axis. So, when the huge pancakes of plasma were forming, they were rotating through the magnetic field of the vortex filament that they were inside. Through this disk generator effect, a set of currents were set up flowing towards the center of the disks and out along their axes. Naturally, these currents, on a smaller scale than those of the primordial vortices, also contracted through the pinch effect into a set of filaments. This new set of filaments played an extremely important role in the next steps of universal evolution. First of all, they transferred angular momentum outward from the disk to the surrounding plasma. So they slowed down the disk. More angular momentum is transferred outwards along the axial filaments that the current forms, which are also rotating. So that further slows down the disk and allows it to contract towards the axis. The generation of the set of smaller filaments set in motion the next stage of the cycle so that they gave rise to the conglomerations of plasma that would become superclusters of galaxies. The process again repeated with the next smaller set of filaments producing the balls of plasma that would become clusters of galaxies, then smaller sets that would become the galaxies themselves, then smaller sets within the galaxies that would become the star clusters, and finally the smallest sets that would produce the stars themselves. So with just these three well-understood processes, we can see how an initially featureless plasma not only could, but must have produced the hierarchy of structure we now see of superclusters, clusters, galaxies, and stars. In our video series, we go into the quantitative detail of how this must have happened, a description first elaborated by Hannes Alfein a half century ago, and a description that is confirmed by abundant observations of these structures today. In the next episode, we'll go into the implications of this narrative of evolution for the here and now. The episode will be coming up pretty soon. In the meantime, please visit our website, subscribe, and view our other videos and also our podcasts. Thanks for listening.